science is advancing. New discoveries are pushing the boundaries of what we know and even what we believe. In recent years, the discovery of interstellar objects like Amuamua traveling in our galactic neighborhood have paved the way for a whole new way of thinking. How long have these once undiscovered objects been flying around the cosmos? And have they even crashed on Earth, offering humans a glimpse at an alien intelligence? My guest today is Bruce Fenton, and he believes that is very much a possibility. It picks up those waves, it activates the programming, and it just rendezvous with Earth, you know, it opens communications, you know, welcome to the galactic civil, you know, civilization mm -hmm. or whatever, because you've reached a detectable level of civilization. Through years of research and sifting through scientific findings, he believes he can propose a theory that not only have interstellar objects crashed on the surface of Earth, but they may be remnants of an alien technology that impacted Earth more than 788,000 years ago. He's about to step into the vault to let us know what he's found. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., and I am looking forward to today's show because it is a topic that I'll admit I'm kind of brand new on, and it uh, is something that I started to dig in with all the talk about interstellar objects and Dr. Avi Loeb, who's been on this program before and his work. Um, it started being bantered about a little bit, so I fired off some FOIA requests. But my guest today, Bruce Fenton, let me bring Bruce on. Bruce, uh, you're going to be talking a lot about that. First off, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join me today on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's a, definitely a topic I'm very interested in. Absolutely. And I obviously caught that on social media. I caught some of the things you were posting, and that is really what piqued my interest. I always, as I just mentioned, love these types of shows because I don't have a lot of background in it. So I'm going to learn right along with the audience as we go through this and, and talk about your work. Many will probably recognize you from doing various television programs. I know Ancient Aliens, Unexplained Files, I believe, uh, was one of the other ones. So it's, it's great to have you here. Before we dive into that, though, I always like to get a little bit of background. Tell everybody who isn't aware, what is your background and what is your main research focus? Sure. I mean, in, in terms of conventional education, I, mean, I have an, an IT um, degree from university in the UK. Uh, I've worked in IT, finance, real estate, a few different places. And that, but my passion for many years has been ancient mysteries, uh, anomalous science, you know, anything that's on the edges of the understood. So, of course, that includes uh, things we might call paranormal, as well as the mysteries of space, you know, and the possibility of life out there. So, I guess it's a fairly it's a fairly wide gamut, but uh, yeah, anything that's just on the fringes of the known has attracted me. So I've probably had about 30 years of delving into uh, various facets of the mysterious. Uh, I'm best known, as you say, perhaps for the appearances on The Unexplained Files, where that was an expedition out into the Georgian Caucasus to look for the bones of giants. And there's a whole backstory to why that was, the, you know, some discoveries that were made there of possibly uh, anomalous bones. Uh, we've also, you know, I've appeared yeah, several times on History Channel's Ancient Aliens as a, one of the talking heads that gives you a couple of opinions here and there. Uh, and also, I think some people may remember that I was involved in an expeditions in the Ecuadorian Amazon to a site which got sort of nicknamed um, the sort of Lost City of Giants. But that was covered by some UK press. And I think, you know, a lot of YouTube channels run stories on that, what seemed to be a strange megalithic wall out in the Yanganatis. So uh, those are probably where people will if they do recognize me will recognize me from and then 
others that are more on the topics that we look at, you know, the mysterious and the fringe, will, will have heard me perhaps on radio shows or, you know, seen me maybe on YouTube videos. So, yeah, so a bit of a mix of a media platform background. And also, I know you've written a couple books uh, with some focal points. Can you can you kind of quickly go over what, what exactly uh, you've written and, and what were they sure. about? Yeah, I've got a, a book that was published back in 2017, which is The Inter-Africa Theory of Human Evolution. So that's an argument that I make that we have a lot of the story of our early origins wrong, that the, the backstory of the Neanderthal, Denisovan, and modern human uh, shared narrative has large uh, inconsistencies in it, which the evidence are now accruing from the cutting edge points to that we don't have that story right and that we are having to rethink and again this is not particularly controversial because actually a lot that's in the book is now accepted for example that Denisovans probably lived down in Australia and in that region uh, that there was all kinds of other hominids little people in Indonesia so, so that whole shift is well underway and that was published in 2017 with a forward from Graham Hancock which I was really stoked to get because of course I think most people will know him as perhaps the best known thinker in the fringe you know I, I don't I don't think there's anyone else that we would uh, say has uh, become better known for his, you know, unconventional thinking. And then I have Exogenesis Hybrid Humans that was published in 2020. And that's on a mixture of UFOs, theories on aliens, um, some discussions of uh, anomalous phenomena. And that also has, that's a foreword from Eric Von Daniken. So, you know, I was really stoked with that. Of course, in, in that field, again, there's, I don't think in terms of ancient aliens and aliens, UFOs, there's many people more more famous than Eric Von Daniken, of course. Um, though, you know, he was probably perhaps best known to the older generation, perhaps. Uh, but I think, you know, most people in these top areas will still at least have seen some of his work, you know, at some stage. So really pleased that both the books got those uh, forwards. They've done fairly well. I mean, in terms of in our kind of domain, I mean, certainly they're they're not selling like Harry Potter or anything like that. But I'm quite pleased with the reviews that I've had put it that way. So I'm quite happy with those. So yeah, good. Um, always interesting topics. Sometimes I'm always a tough sell on some angles. Other mm -hmm. angles are, are kind of interesting, and I always love diving into that. So maybe if mm -hmm. uh, if you, if you enjoy the next hour or so, maybe we'll bring you mm -hmm. back and talk a little bit more about those topics. But sure. today, what we were uh, going to dive into was when we were speaking on social media, what caught my eye was you were talking about some, uh, essentially some some scientific evidence that, mm -hmm. I, you didn't say it in these words, but I kind of felt that you felt there wasn't a lot of attention to it. And I love stories sure. like that because if there's science and work and evidence and test results or something that doesn't get a lot of, of uh, spotlight, I'm always, I'm all over it. I wanna see it, you know, because I, I, ha mm -hmm. I obviously haven't seen it myself. So that caught my eye. Uh, obviously, we're talking about uh, interstellar objects, which Amuamua has been one of the bigger, more mm -hmm. more widely known, talked about uh, interstellar object as of late. Obviously, Dr. Avi Loeb has talked about that a lot. But you mm -hmm. were mentioning something different. So let me pass it to you. What has your focal point been on that arena? Yeah, absolutely. So from 2017, we had the first identification of an internet object of the Oumuamua, which I, by now I imagine almost everyone listening has heard of Oumuamua. I'd be quite surprised if they hadn't. So since then, we've had two other confirmations of interstellar objects, and that's uh, Comet Borisov, which uh, I think was 2018. I think it was quite soon afterwards. And then just recently, we've had the confirmation that a small bolide that exploded over Papua New Guinea in 2014 was in fact some kind of interstellar object, you know, quite a small one by comparison to either the others, but was no less was interesting and had come from somewhere outside our solar system. So we now have three of these confirmed in quite a short period of time. So you think from 2017 to now, before that, they were unknown uh, theoretical objects that many scientists would have discounted, just felt that they didn't exist. You know, that's a, a familiar story throughout the histories of science that, um, you know, phenomena that has been discounted has turned out to be not only real, but possibly quite common. And can so I interject real quick and have you explain why there was a resistance to this until they were discovered? What makes them so unique mm -hmm. or different? Sure. One of the 
one of the conundrums was that when you look at just the the distance between stars and you look at the amount of empty space there is out there, it was theorized that there would be some of these interstellar objects probably, but they would almost never interact with you know other stars. They would just be flying through those vast gaps between the stars, and there'd be a small number of these objects thrown out of alien solar systems, right? So the occasional comet. But nobody expected there to be enough of them that we would encounter one, you know, in, in our solar system, sort of visible to us. So it was kind of surprising when they first detected Oumuamua. And that, I think, has then opened the door to looking for more of these. And, and the fact that we've now got two others, I think that shows us that it's one of, those, one of those kind of situations where if you're not looking for something and you don't believe in it, you're really unlikely to notice it because nobody is actually putting in the effort. You know, they're not checking for these. So also there's technological limitations. Of course, our technologies have been improving. So astronomers have, you know, a lot more access to uh, satellite technologies, you know, and we've seen we've got ever improving telescopes. So I, I think there's a mixture there of the technology reaching a level where we will detect these more easily. But also there was a bit of luck with Umuma and it's it's opened the mental floodgates as much as physical floodgates for scientists to then say, well, there must be more of these. Let's start looking. But you can see that is why the skepticism was there. I think is that the idea that you'd need quite a lot of these. In fact, you need a, a vast number theoretically to allow for that kind of flow of them coming through our solar system. So now there's a big question around this. Are there an unbelievable number of these, you know, billions or trillions of these things flying around? Or are some of them directed? In which case that cuts down the number needed, but of course makes them more interesting. And Avi Loeb has kind of already, he's gone to the side of that maybe some of these are directed and he suspects that both Oumuamua and the object from Papua New Guinea 2014, that these might both be some kind of alien technologies, either defunct or probes. Uh, and I think that's one of the major interesting angles to this, that we now have, you know, kind of a top astronomer, Harvard astronomer saying that, you know, it makes more sense in a way if some of these are directed. In your mind and in your view, with what we've seen now and discovered with Amuamua and and beyond it now, what now is is telling you that um, that that there's possibly some kind of alien technology here or background to it versus it, it just being a celestial object that broke away from the gravitational pull of wherever it was and away it goes through the uh, universe and cosmos and it just by chance ended up here. What sticks out that there's something more to it? Well, it was a couple of things. I mean, I would firstly say that I'd recommend people to, of course, to check out Ari Loeb's book, which is um, uh, Extraterrestrial, because he goes into some depth there as to why he suspects, for example, these the first object, Umumua, was alien, which it had all kinds of peculiar aspects, including an unusually high level of reflectivity. So suggesting it had a very reflective surface. There was data indicating it was essentially like a pancake, a bit like a kind of saucer shaped, but a pancake quite thin. And as well as that, that it was traveling uh, in an angle that takes it through the plane of our solar system between basically Earth and Mars, which is kind of interesting that it would happen to cross the plane and between, if you think about it, two, the only two habitable planets, well, we, Mars we believe was habitable. So if it was a directed probe, that's an interesting angle of you know, entry into our solar system. So when you mesh that with other aspects, they had the rotation of the object, and then finally it was an anomalous boost as it left the solar system, that it pulled away from the sun and accelerated in an unexpected way. So there was no sign of the outgassing, which would be expected if it was a comet. So they couldn't really detect any you know, source for this. So that's why Oumuamua became kind of a suspicious object the second one that's been suggested as you know possibly extraterrestrial this object in papua new guinea as that came in it seemed to uh, survive far longer than we'd expect suggesting that the material composition is harder and more you know more uh, sturdy than iron and iron meteorites right so it, it came quite low you know low into the atmosphere before exploding so again there's some theorizing that maybe its composition is anomalous and that it could be because it's artificial some kind of material that protected it right so there's some reasoning there with the work i'm doing 
it's you know we'll go into some depth of course into this but the object that i'm looking at it appeared <laughs> the most glaring aspects is there's evidence suggesting that an interstellar object ended up in orbit around our planet before fragmenting and raining down as debris now if something and it's quite large so if something fairly large ends up captured by our planet that in itself is fairly anomalous because if we, what we know of so far are quite small objects like bus size and smaller that have become sort of temporary moons of the earth and that these are then these are destabilized by the sun's gravity and they they move away but we do occasionally that happens i think a couple of years back there was at one of these strange you know temporary satellites but we're talking about something quite large at least a kilometer or multiple kilometers across to do the debris size that we have that's come in and if it's coming in from interstellar space it'd be expected to be traveling faster than normal comets and asteroids you know these things are, are not limited by the same speeds that we see for you know internal objects of the solar system right because they they are all limited by the sun's gravitational pull right so interstellar objects are typically recognized by having a greater speed as they come in so now if we have a large object that's coming in from interstellar space and then it's you know traveling faster than a normal object and is somehow ends up in the orbit of the earth even approaching the earth you know is quite lucky but the fact that it somehow ends up captured and in orbit that's very suspicious so this is one of the, the major reasons why i'm very intrigued by the object that i'm dealing with even now it's just debris. Uh, that would be the biggest probably red flag for why it would be interesting uh, as an of itself before going into the you know, slightly more complex sort of chemical arguments and arguments about the debris itself. Uh, but hopefully I guess people some ideas. You have to think about that. Why would you know a, a large, extraordinarily fast object end up as a temporary moon of the Earth? So let me like. back you up just to make sure that, I, that I'm following you correctly. So what you're... Mm -hmm research on our physical object or objects from a debris field in Papua New Guinea? So the first one, the object from Papua New Guinea has debris which hasn't been recovered yet. Okay. So that's when the Avi Loeb is actually attempting to recover debris. I gotcha. From. Okay. That's the one yeah. that's underwater that he wants to go grab. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Now so the, he's the debris. To do that. Gotcha. So then the debris that you're talking about was from So this is called Australasian tectite. And so it's a glassy material that's found spread right across from southern China down to northern Antarctica. It stretches about 12,000 kilometers, uh, and it's about 10,000 kilometers wide debris field going from Madagascar out beyond sort of Papua. Uh, vast. So about 20% of the Earth's surface has you know, some amount of Australasian tectite glass on it. Now, this has been kind of a mysterious phenomena for, well, in terms of serious scientific investigation for at least about 160 years and there's been all kinds of theories as to how we've ended up with you know this unbelievably vast debris field because of course you know even with you know, impact stuff you don't normally see anything on that scale right so it was interesting from the beginning the first person to actually write on this in terms of um, you know a fairly serious scientific hypothesis was actually Charles Darwin which is kind of funny because, you know, obviously a very notable figure in history. Uh, and he was given a piece of this tectite when he was visiting Australia. And he theorized that it was from a volcanic event there because it's very similar to obsidian uh, in, in a number of ways. For example, it's, um, I should start prefaces a little bit because in terms of glasses, there are essentially, you know, there's only obviously a few number of types. We have volcanic glass, obsidians. We have artificial glasses that we manufacture we have impact melt glasses so when a meteor hits the ground it melts the rock converts that into glass and we have um, nuclear blast glasses okay which some people be familiar with nuclear test sites and then of course we have these tectites and tectites are compositionally very similar to both artificial glass and to obsidians and the reason why that is is because when you manufacture glass you do it in the crucible you know you heat it so you put the kind of chemicals you want in there that's heated that's mixed and that's for a period of time and that removes volatile chemicals you don't want in there and you allow the bubbles to be removed that's called the fining process mixing the chemicals in you know 
fairly throughout the mix. It makes a homogeneous mix. So homogeneity is essentially the equal distribution of the chemical components throughout the mix. And so you end up with what's called a homogeneous fined glass. Volcanic glass is also a homogeneous fined glass. And the reason for that, of course, is because it's formed in the caldera of a volcano where it's, it's mixing and heating for an extended period of time. So you end up with very similar glass products in a way with very few bubbles, quite well mixed um, and with you know, some overlaps in terms of the isotopics and the chemical volatiles because there's a lot of similarity there. And then when you look at impact glasses and nuclear blast glasses, those are quite different. And that's because when you get a, a short lived high energy event, right, you'll get a lot of melting of you know sand and rock and so and because it's happening fast, you'll get very frothy, foamy material where the water and volatiles start to outgas, but then there's very rapid cooling because of course the blast has finished. You know, it's quick. There's an explosion, it stops. So that glass begins to cool rapidly, bubbles are frozen inside. You also have a lot of partly melted material from the edges of the blast. And so those are included. Volat you also get, tend to get organics like you know, soil included. Mm -hmm and pieces of unmelted material. So you'll see that both in terms of asteroid impact crater sites and in these nuclear blast sites. So th those are essentially the two different kinds of glasses. Tektites, which are theorized normally to be from asteroid impact, they are unlike impact glasses and are much more like the volcanic glass and the man-made glass. And this is one reason why there's a big mystery around this. So, so there's, and I don't mean to jump in sure. over you there, but so there are, indicators here that it's manufactured uh, partially at least it, it indicates that, yeah that there's been a process in the background that we don't fully understand that's very similar to manufacturing or is manufacturing right because you somehow have to explain this period of, of mixing and you know fining which again we only know from extended heating and extended time for the glass to mix so this is why there's a sort of a mystery that has persisted around the topic uh, give you a little bit back because there was there was for a long time there were two competing hypotheses right as you go to the beginning there was a lot of different hypotheses and I think if people are familiar with how science works usually you start off if there's a, an anomaly or a mystery uh, a lot of different theorists emerge they will all come out with their own hypothesis and that would be te each one will be tested and in a course and the one that is you know best fit for all of the observed data will usually end up becoming the consensus theory right it doesn't necessarily explain everything and it's not necessarily correct but it will become the consensus until something better comes along right and so initially there were all kinds of hypotheses like super volcanoes throwing material for miles um actually was it some kind of um i forgot the word now antimatter event um others that said you know molten glass block that flew over there's there's also even a lost technology an aboriginal technology from some civilization so you can imagine there was this whole list of theories one by one they were kind of knocked out and that we ended up with was two competing hypotheses one was championed mostly by nasa engineers and rocket scientists right and so this was the idea that the material was a volcanic glass that had been impacted by an asteroid on the moon and that this glass had been displaced and had either come across to earth as a you know as a cluster or as a block or some kind of debris cloud and had then rained down across the earth it ended up in orbit and had rained down across australasia right so that hypothesis had a lot of supporters again a lot of very you know credentialed people over at nasa that were doing all kinds of um, experiments to see the how these glasses would have formed you know what speeds they would have come in at this is you know, sort of around the time when really we were just getting into the whole field of you know rockets missiles trying to get people to the moon so, so these guys you know there was a kind of a whole new field had opened up and they recognized that some of these tektites had aerodynamic shaping suggesting that they'd come in from outside the atmosphere right not all of it but some of them do and then conversely on the other side of the debate were the others who believed that this was some kind of terrestrial impact event where material had been displaced and had been either thrown through the air or had somehow left the atmosphere and had come back in and that raged as a debate for many many years until really until the return and analysis of lunar materials which led to an understanding that 
there just wasn't the kind of chemical mix that you required for this glass and that volcanic so they ruled out the the moon they ruled out volcanic activity on the moon as well is too ancient so with the dating also this material at 788,000 years that's just too recent in terms of lunar volcanic activity so you said 788,000 years 788,000 years old is the dating on it so that's really well after we believe the moon's volcanic activity had ceased. Uh, so you had a few different factors that came together. And very good to add on, there's a, a, a Nobel winning chemist called Uri who had also highlighted that even if a cloud of this debris had come from the moon, the sun's pull would disperse this cloud and it would end up falling all around the planet. Or conversely, if it was a tight cluster, it would only rain down around 10 kilometer kind of strewn field it'd be really small by the time it broke up in our atmosphere here it would be a small 10 kilometer long strewn field so he said n in neither of those models could he see how you'd end up with you know australasia being you know covered in this material it'd either be the whole world or a much smaller area right so there were several lines that led to the kind of the collapse of the lunar origin theory now as these people left the battlefield you could say they said well look you know you guys you still have to explain all the anomalies. You have to be able to explain why some of this material has the indications of having been in orbit from an object that was in orbit and that is broken up and has come in at angles that suggest a decaying orbital path and have been reshaped, secondary melting. So in other words, they were already cold glass spheres that came in at angles that were shallow enough to allow them to have secondary melting rather than burning up and to land across Australasia. So they could see that there was there was an issue there because they could not see how an impact would lead to not only material leaving the atmosphere, but coming in at these gentle angles as though they were brick from a breaking up object in orbit. So this is where it kind of they kind of pied away. And then since then, really, the mainstream view has been that this is simply a, some kind of anomalous melt glass that just needs a few more explanations to tidy up the story and move on. But it's it's never quite got to that. There remains ongoing debates as to how that actually can be explained. So is there talk then that this is a interstellar object that that and and again making sure I'm not skipping anything here, but mm -hmm versus the theories that before they discovered the interstellar object, it sounds like they never really entertained that type of a explanation. But now fast forward to today where we're discovering these objects, is the is that conversation turning to that? Well, I haven't seen anyone who definitely has suggested, but one thing that's interesting is there's a paper that came out just I think a couple of weeks back in which they are going to look for craters from interstellar objects you know mostly it's going to be on the surfaces of other you know other planets and other moons and so you're looking at our moon and looking at I, I imagine other planets they haven't really said too much about earth I think the idea is that they're hoping to you know somewhere it'd be well preserved you know obviously the, the moon is considered a kind of uh, almost like a repository of everything that's ever happened because it's got very little geological activity so you've probably heard scientists are saying you know if we were going to look for alien artifacts we could look on the moon because it's pretty unchanging so a lot of the focus is going to be there but one of the one of the things that they are expecting is interstellar objects that impact will be going at unusually high rates of speed and therefore we'll also create more melt glass in their craters than in normal impact events that's kind of interesting because in the four or five um, tech type strewn fields all of those have produced vast amounts of glass so I would think that somebody somewhere is probably starting to wonder you know is is this to do with what we're seeing in this mysterious kind of tech type research field uh, particularly when you start putting in this link of it producing more glass than other impacts and these strewn fields are very large I mean just to very quickly say this although the Australasian tech type strewn field is the biggest and it's totally enormous you can look and see there's um four other there's a strewn field in the u.s we've got the georgia sites and beta sites there's a strewn field in the ivory coast in africa uh, there's another in the moldavite tectite strewn field moldavites are the best known i imagine a lot of the audience will know moldavites because it's a very distinctive green gem looking material that's used in jewelry and stuff and you also have uh, recently there's a discovery of what seems to be a very small tectite strewn field in central america so all of them are considered somewhat anomalous because again if you think about this we've had 
obviously an astonishing number of impacts on this planet. Most of them are not recorded. We found a couple of hundred or so well-studied craters, you know, and in those, the melt glass is unlike tectites, right? So then you have just these four or five examples of a phenomena, and yet you have many more craters with glass. So we know something different's happening, right? So even from a very conservative, conventional kind of scientific view, you would look at that and say, well, why don't we usually see this tectite glass with these quite extensive strewn fields for all of these impacts? You know, why is it only in these few? And in each of the other four cases, apart from Australasian, this, there has been at least tentative links to a crater. Now, I don't think in any of these cases it's 100% certain that they've identified the crater because the glass isn't in the crater. No tectites are found in craters, right? They are they are found in some cases um, several hundred or even you know longer distances from the suspected impact craters. So that's a problem because, of course, if you don't so find several it hundred. Time, I'm sorry, you said several hundred, but several hundred what miles? Um, or? So, like, say, six hundred kilometers away. Say, from oh, gotcha. Crater, okay. One example. So, if you have that kind of distance, of course, you don't get the hand in glove fit that you would normally for an impact event. Where you know, if we, you and I went out to a crater and we find glass in that crater, we we're going to be pretty sure that that's from that impact, right? But when you start having to look for the impact event that you think has created some glass and you have to travel hundreds of kilometers to find a crater, straight away that link is becoming more tentative, right? So now you're trying to get a very close chemical match between the crater rock and this glass. So even in the cases where there's, I think, fairly good arguments for them being impacts, we know something extraordinary has happened to propel this debris so far and for none of it to be in the crater and for it to be melted in this way that makes it resemble artificial glass or volcanic glass, knowing that it is supposedly not artificial and is definitely not volcanic. So then we have the problem to say, well, what is going on here? Now, one explanation that might be that these are interstellar objects, that they are coming in far faster than normal impacts and that that's why we're seeing something else happening because this is a class of objects that were unknown and nobody to my knowledge apart from obviously myself talking to you about it has actually come out and said that. i haven't seen any you know even speculative articles or papers suggesting that but that's kind of funny because i would think that now that we know since 2017 we know that these are legitimate objects we've got you know avi Loeb going as far as saying maybe they're you know alien probes in two cases and that Perhaps there's material on Earth that we can recover. So even that all of that's happening, I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen people saying, well, let's look at the known or you know, theoretically known impacts. Are any of these uh, unusual? And do any of them seem to produce more glass? Uh, so the, to me, it seems like a no-brainer that you would at least be looking at these rare types of glass associated with strange events. So that's even before you get to where I, I'm suggesting, and maybe I'll be low, that some of these interstellar objects are alien. I just think that we should be now revisiting known geological events, right? And saying, okay, we've got a new class of objects. Do we have anything strange in the geological record that might suggest that we have some of these impacting in the past or arriving here, at least? Uh, I think that these are obvious candidates personally, especially when we deal with this idea that they produce more glass because in, in all these cases, there's an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of this melt glass that's been found. Um, so and on top of this, another paper that came out about, I think it's just a couple of months ago, uh, was asking the question, how often would interstellar objects pass through the solar system? Of course, it's a, it's a really big question. So based on a few known factors, and of course, we've got three of these now known so they can start to make some kind of calculations uh, we've already had calculations of the number that must exist for them to if they are natural for how many that they've seen to come here as we discussed earlier so they've started to do the crunch the numbers on this and the paper that i saw suggested that around seven interstellar objects a year should pass through the inner solar system so not just through the entire solar system but the inner solar system where the earth is uh, you know somewhat close enough to be you know seen or maybe have a probe sent to now that's that's kind of interesting if you take that back to the beginning of earth's history well that starts to be like over 30 billion of these objects that have passed through this way right so 
it doesn't take any big leaps to think that some of those have impacted with the earth so you think 30 billion objects we're going to have had some of these let's say a few hundred even right that have come close enough to either break up in the atmosphere or have impacted directly and have got debris somewhere on the planet so we would expect to see signs of that in the geological record now if everyone starts to you know, sweep through saying okay well we know seven a year coming through we know a certain percentage of those must hit is there anything indicating strange impacts or of objects that are broken up in orbit anything like that that seems anomalous i would say tectites five in the whole history of five tune fields in the whole history of the planet that we know of that would stand out straight away as as odd so I, I think hope that gives people some context to why the whole field really is i think crying out for a, a rethink even though i'm focused on australasian tectites um for a couple of reasons i don't mind i can explain i don't i, I can go on not if you want me to stop there for a moment otherwise i can explain why i feel that they're more interesting well, yes, and that actually kind of leads into the question I've been wanting to ask you is that you went over the different fields on the planet, and I know you touched on them briefly, but is the one, the field that you're talking about and more focused on, is it set so far apart from the others that you feel that that leans towards a possibility of an interstellar object and the others do not? Or are you proposing that all of them that you went through, all of the, I think five, you said there was mm -hmm. five or so, that every event of the that coincides with these fields may represent an interstellar object that and and it sounds like maybe you can answer that with kind of differentiating why you're so focused on this one absolutely yes yeah. so my my strong suspicion is that all five are associated with interstellar objects um i have my paper focuses only on the australasian because that's how i kind of got into the topic was in that area but there's a i have a lot of reasons to suspect they all are interstellar objects part of that is because all of them involve uh, part of the composition is a kind of a rare earth um, like chemicals that you wouldn't expect to turn up in five rare impact events, right? So it's like me saying, okay, that there's, if you imagine there's, I don't know, half a dozen places on earth where you have metal X now, and you find that there's these five or six impacts of some strange objects, and all of them have metal X, right? You're going to be scratching your head thinking, what's the chances that five unusual incidents all happen on sites on the earth that have that metal X. So is it more likely that that happened or that the object contained metal X, right? Because then you're thinking if all of these strange objects involve a compound, you wouldn't expect to be there in most impact events because it's rare on the earth's surface. To find it in all of them, again, indicates to me that that's part of the content of the object. It's not material from the earth's surface. And again, this isn't my thinking. This is, you know, I've read that in other studies where it's been highlighted that that seems extraordinarily unlikely. So in other words, this must be part of the impactor. And so if they're all containing this rare material we don't normally see in asteroids, comets, and is only rarely found on the Earth's surface, that's another indicator that we're dealing with something that doesn't have the typical composition of known asteroids and comets. We expect interstellar comets and asteroids to have a different composition because they formed in alien solar systems right so again these are the kind of clues that we're dealing with something else now australasian tectite is particularly interesting because apart from being the largest strewn field by far you know let's say stretching twelve thousand kilometers which is just immense uh, involving possibly i think there was one one in uh, one calculation i saw was maybe up to something like 10 trillion tons of debris i mean that's just wild wow. yeah absolutely massive debris field uh, that there's something different that's happened here and this is partly because we have no there's no crater associated with it so that's been a mystery for a long time because um depending on who you look at whose estimates this should involve a crater of somewhere between 10 and 100 kilometers across and it should be fairly young so this is even to give some plausibility to the idea of it being impact material. It would have to be quite a large crater. It would have to have sufficient force to break a hole in the atmosphere, to essentially punch through the atmosphere, have a vacuum kind of filled hole. So you can, fill a, you can have a vacuum filled. But there essentially this hole would be punched through. Material then escapes through the vacuum, right, or travels through vacuum and can move either further you know, further uh, horizontally, or can move all the way up into the atmosphere. Now, it's important that you have vacuum because 
when you have an impact, the material, no matter how fast it's going at the beginning, so you've got hypervelocity impact. Let's just say rock is thrown out of that impact at these unbelievable speeds. So let's say it could be um, you know eight kilometers a second or so, and that these will these will travel uh, pushing up against air, right? And the lower the angle that they are traveling at, the the denser the atmosphere of the Earth. So you know a very acute angle, the density of that air is slowing down the ejector faster. Right. And if you go to a more obtuse angles, of course, they have to go up further to travel the same distance. They're traveling much further, right? Because you're going in this huge arc upwards and back down. So in both in both ways of looking, you've got a problem. So the calculation of the the optimum angle for maximum spread is about 45 degrees, about first, sorry, 30 to 45 degrees for maximum displacement to a, a furthest distance. Right. But even then, it's considered there to be uh, almost you know, impossible or super extreme difficulties for any of this material to travel further than 600 kilometers. So you rarely find any melt or ejector that is further than 600 kilometers from its source crater. So straight away you have a limitation there, right? So they know that this cannot be material that has simply been thrown through the air and has traveled 10,000 kilometers. That, that's totally impossible. And that's accepted okay so there has to be an exotic solution and one of the exotic solutions is this hole as i say that somehow this material in some plasma storm or this vacuum area has traveled either conventionally horizontal and that's a problem because if, if it's traveling say at 30 degrees through the air and you've got an area of vacuum it will continue traveling at these colossal speeds but when it impacts, it will essentially be impacting like a small mi like meteorite. So it will just go straight to the ground. Mm -hmm. You will mix with material. You'll melt the rock. You'll have a small crater. You wouldn't find little pieces of glass. You wouldn't find these conveniently shaped, um, pure pieces of glass. They would just impact and melt and you know and cause small holes. And stuff. So they know it can't be that. So all you're left with then is the material has left the atmosphere and has ended up going up in a kind of a, an arc and has come back down. And it's rained down. Now that's the only this kind of exotic solution. And there's a, there's a whole series of problems with achieving that, even for a small amount of debris, let alone what may be trillions of tons. And in some cases, these pieces are like tw twenty kilos. There's some chunks of like twenty kilo what they call muong nong tech type right, associated with the debris field. Other pieces, some of the rounded pieces, are, are up to about I think it's something like. Um, 10 kilos but there's, there's some quite large tectites so again we're not talking just about you know tiny droplets these are quite significant pieces i think well for something like that to successfully travel all the way up to space it is that's quite extraordinary and then for quite you know this amount of the debris to do that is again it's problematic so that's why there's been this raging debate for years and years as to how that's achieved and then on top of that, it has to come in at these gentle angles, right? So it's not just coming up and then coming back down at the same angle it went up. It's somehow ending up in an orbital path and coming in at angles that are almost horizontal to the plane of the planet, i.e. very much like satellites that are coming down, you know, slowly losing their height. And, and that's been pointed by a number of sort of mathematicians and physicists that that just doesn't seem to add up. They can't see how that would result in that kind of violent event. So and that's, that's the going kind of mainstream scientific theory that there this stuff went up from the earth came back down that mm -hmm. go kind of didn't um betraying what we know about science and math and angles and so on is not necessarily possible so right making sure that i'm on the same page that's the mm -hmm. going theory but there's so mm -hmm. many issues with it it's more plausible that something came from way out there at mm -hmm. a bigger speed of immense size came here and essentially crashed or impacted well i mean it's basically it's more parsimonious with the data is that something was in orbit now where that something came from and how it ended up there is the question but it, the more parsimonious solution is you have a large something that is glassy already glassy and that it then breaks up in orbit for some unknown reason and that that debris continues traveling in that same orbital path but coming down Gently, so you can imagine. So, if we had, like, say, the ISS um, blew up in orbit, the pieces of debris will carry on traveling. You know, some of them will be sent upwards, some maybe downwards. Obviously, in an explosive event, but some parts of that will continue round in a decaying orbit, 
right? And eventually those are going to come down, okay? So it's more parsimonious that we have some kind of object up there that has broken up. And what we are seeing is its debris field as it travels between like Indochina and Antarctica, traveling that kind of direction. You've got the debris field as raining down. So an initial explosive event over Indochina where we have a clustering of the tech type debris, which is around Philippines, Thailand, that area. There's another clustering of debris in southern Australia, southern Australia, where you've got more of the, particularly of the button tectites, which is these aerodynamically shaped tectites that definitely came in from space. Uh, and then you have some more micro tectites down in Antarctica. The micro tectites traveled furthest. So we know that's the end of the debris field, basically. These minuscule tectites that are found in the ice in Antarctica. So it, it looks more like an object that's breaking up as it moves between into China and Australia, and that if we infer that this, there is no known mechanism for creating this kind of glass, right? There's a couple of again exotic hypotheses out there from mm -hmm. scientists, right? But they are definitely exotic. They're not accepted. You know, they are just hypotheses as to how somehow you might achieve this melt without an extended period in something like a you know caldera or in a uh, you know artificial process um so of course there's, there's going to be people offering these but the most parsimonious is this really that it's already glassy and there's a number of the nasa guys kind of put this out there even back in the 60s they're like well you know it seems to be that we already have a glassy object and that's why they again this is looping back this is why they thought it was volcanic glass from the moon because they were trying to understand how you'd have a pre-existing glassy material coming in cold you know, entering the atmosphere and then ha going through secondary melting. So they know it's already been melted, it's already hard, it's already fine homogeneous glass, and now it's melting again in the upper atmosphere and raining down. So their hypothesis was it was must be volcanic glass from the moon because that was just about as wild as their thinking was going to go. Now, I've only ever seen one one paper where someone said, well, you know, could it have been something from further out and it somehow came in and ended up in orbit there's all sorts of problems with that like how did it get stuck in orbit why would that something then explode in orbit and so they almost as a passing thought they just you know put that out there and discount it and again i think that was because at the time nobody really believed in these interstellar objects they you know what i mean so what object would that be you know yeah. it's nothing like that so i think that the idea of a, an alien glassy body was so far out that it was much easier to hypothesize lunar material and the other problem as well is that when you look at the the evidence of cosmic ray bombardment which like any object that's happened in the solar system right is bombarded with cosmic rays right we can we can measure that and we can see that it's been up there for like millions of years or billions of years right and nearly all the objects up there have been up there for vast periods flying round and round right so when they measured it in these glasses, they found it was it was very low, suggesting that it hadn't been in space for very long, certainly not long enough to indicate that it was a, an asteroid or a comet that had been spinning around for millions of years, that maybe only a few thousand, at max, a few thousand years. So there's nothing like, again, there's no objects like that. They're, they're all really old. So they thought, well, it has to have formed in the Earth-Moon system or nearby. So this glass has to have formed somewhere there. So again, that limited it. So it had to be either the Moon or the earth right so what could the third option be well that the object has formed i.e blown up melted somewhere between the earth and the moon but it hasn't formed on the moon and it cannot have come in uh, as it was from space retaining its levels of cosmic ray data it's been it reset now that would happen of course in a heating event or if the object's shell had been penetrated by cosmic rays but then it melted that's all going to be mixed in and you won't be able to detect the true age of the object anymore so again these these all point to it being not from the moon but glassy and having been melted in space and then in orbit you know crumbling apart pieces mm. coming down now so that leaves this idea then well what kind of object can that be because we don't know of anything like that there's no you know there's no comets or asteroids that are made of glass i mean that's the bottom line we if this was a glassy body it's either a natural object that we don't know of, you know, that's come in from interstellar space. There's nothing like that known in the solar system, right? Uh, it's got about 75% silica. The highest silica content of an asteroid is around 
that's unknown to have higher silica content. So again, that's strange. And then if it is glassy, well, there's no objects that are just glass that are flying around out there. So if this has come from somewhere else, then either there's a category of objects in interstellar space that are natural and are glassy and are formed in some way we don't understand, right? Which is possible. Or and we rarely uh, see them. Is that what, is that where you're going with that? That that if it is natural, then it is incredibly rare. Incredibly rare and it's incredibly strange because then we've got what process would lead to a basically a glass asteroid, you know, like a glass, a big chunk of glass flying around space. I mean, it's just a really implicitly weird object. So if it is natural, that's amazing. Don't get me wrong. I think that would be amazing to find out mm -hmm. there was a whole class of objects that were like big chunks of glass flying around interstellar space, right? I mean, I'm interested in cool natural discoveries, like I'm sure you are and a lot of other people. Are. Mm -hmm. But of course, the other possibility there is that it's not natural. Mm -hmm. And if it's not natural, if it's something that's been fined and made homogenous in an artificial process and we didn't do it, then we're talking about something really amazing. Because then we're talking about probably some kind of artificial intelligent probe because my thinking here is that if you look at the kind of cutting edge thinkers in the field you know, in terms of SETI and whatnot they think that most alien civilizations will be post-biological that is that they would have transitioned to become cybernetic or silica or artificial life forms and if not that that they may have gone extinct left their technologies behind and almost certainly that first contact with any alien intelligence will be with its technologies. And again, this is when, of course, Avi Loeb's thinking is that we are most likely to find aliens by their debris or their probes, right? So if we're going to look for something like that, what might we look for? Well, an alien brace rod probe, or, or, which is essentially an, an artificial intelligence that is autonomous, sent out to explore, we would expect that to be highly silica, basically like a roving silica network. Right. So if those are out there, they can also be of almost unlimited size. There's no particular reason why we, they should be tiny. They might be tiny, like micro probes like we're looking at doing. We're sending out, you know, these little box probes to explore the solar system. But they could also be enormous silica brains, right? They're just flying around, exploring. They're quasi immortal and, you know, surveying the solar, you know, surveying the galaxy on behalf of their biological creators or their, you know, silica creators, who knows? And that these things would be high in silica content they would i imagine behave in strange ways like parking around interesting planets planets with biospheres like earth right because you think of all the planets that we know of earth is the only one so far that we have confirmed a biosphere on it right so i, I hear a lot of scientists and skeptics saying oh what's interesting about earth why, why would anybody come here and you know i'm sure you've seen these kind of dismissive arguments and i, I think mm -hmm. that's really strange because you know, when we look out into the cosmos, we find no, so far, no planets with identifiable biospheres. So wouldn't that be interesting? You know, if you're an alien scientist and you notice Earth and you notice that it's got an oxygen signature, right? The oxygen signature of Earth has been visible remotely for two billion years. Right? So there's plenty of time for someone out there to notice that there's probably life here. Then you can send one of your artificial probes you know, many could be different civilizations sending them here in that time. That's a lot of time. Don't need faster than light speeds or any of that. Right. So all those arguments go out the window that you need to have these super fast. You don't just send a probe, at, say, let's say half light speed um, from wherever you are in the galaxy. Right. So that's going to have plenty of time to get here. And these things then could be autonomous. That's it. They can monitor on their own. You know, they can think on their own, monitor, do whatever it is they've been programmed to do. And in one scenario that I've seen uh, proposed, I don't know if it proposed by Bracewell himself, but there's certainly a, a hypothesis that they might even be programmed to make contact. And that, you know, a certain level of a civilization development, one of these things could just, you know, fire up. Let's say that we send out radio signals into the cosmos and that one of these is sitting in the asteroid belt. It picks up those waves, it activates the programming, and it just rendezvous with Earth, you know, it opens communications, you know, welcome to the galactic civil, you know, civilization mm -hmm. or whatever, because you've reached a detectable level of civilization that it's been instructed to look for. And it's just hovering around the only planets with biospheres. Now, I get, I get that goes a bit into sci fi, but if you think about it, it's not really that strange. It's exactly the kind of thing we would do. Right, as intelligent beings searching the cosmos, sending out our probes, you know, these are things that we are aiming to do. 
so this has the kind of the what I would say is the hallmarks of something like that an object that is seemingly have a strange con you know strange composition a glassy silica composition as well as various metals but you know it's 75 percent silica 10 percent aluminium uh, a number of the metals at lower levels but this thing it seems to have parked itself in orbit if we go on the nasa data again you know i didn't come up with it no, nothing i'm saying i've come up with other than the interpretation right so it seems to have parked itself in orbit uh, broke and for some reason broke apart we don't know how long it would have been in orbit so you could be dealing with something that was there for millions of years had a catastrophic failure or you know was impacted by something who knows right or maybe it was programmed to self-destruct at some point you can go into those sort of hypotheticals why that would happen because if it's artificial then that gives you more you know room for thinking than if it was just a big comet or something that was caught somehow because why would that explode i don't know i can't think of any reason why a natural object would be orbiting and then suddenly melt right because that'd be super weird so we have this object that then breaks up the debris rains down across this vast field because it's in orbit you don't need this exotic solution of something impacting and sending a trillion tons of debris into space and somehow coming in at these angles it's much more parsimonious to say it's in space it's already glassy it's broken up the debris gets secondary melting from you know this impact but the initial event the explosion has melted it to glass to this mixed glass and then the secondary melting is as the debris comes in right this just it matches what we see even if it is not let's say it's not right because you know science rarely reaches a point where you can say it's something's proven that's like a, a higher standard than i think almost any scientist aims for you know because it's rare that you can actually get to the point where you can say there's no possibility you're wrong right and so you could say well i'm sure there's you know couldn't it be something else Bruce? well yes i mean maybe there are as we said earlier maybe there are natural objects like that or maybe there is something about an impact that was so strange that we just haven't understood the physics of it yet right so you have to be open to those possibilities but if we don't look at these anomalies how will we ever find these kinds of things john that's the the big question if we always go for the oh, well, you know, it was probably natural, probably it's something about impacts we don't understand. Oh, in 50 years or 100 years, somebody will clear this up. It's definitely not aliens. Move on. And I, I think that would be a tragedy if we do that every time. The thing that sticks out to me, and, and like I said in the, in the beginning of the show, I'm very new to this, but always fascinated, you know, to, to learn other people's research and the science behind it as much as I can understand. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that, that sticks out to me is that kind of evidence of the two burn where you have signs of a manufactured type glass object that is just mm -hmm. kind of defying what we know about uh, the universe and our solar system. Then you have that secondary burn. Um, I'm not saying that that's indicative of, of alien just on that, but, but my question to you based on that is why isn't there more entertainment to these types of ideas? Because when you were going over those, what you were calling, you know, exotic explanations of, you know, just, just so many different variables that have to go into play to make the size of the debris field mm -hmm. and the angles that they have to go into and, and so many other factors that just didn't seem plausible. Sure. We want to talk about Occam's razor as silly as it, it as some people may uh, think that it sounds a mm -hmm. manufactured extraterrestrial object may actually mm -hmm. be the more simpler answer. Um, so with that said, why isn't there more entertainment to that idea? And and correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like there's pushback on that, that they want to find mm -hmm. a Earth based exotic explanation rather than now broadening the th the theory base based on the new information we have about interstellar objects and kind of this uncharted territory that science is is really just kind of getting into yeah I, I think it's because that last thing that i think it's because science is just getting into this uh that we we may well see some scientists start to pivot and question this i mean to be honest i until about five years ago saying I'd, I'd never heard of tektites to be honest I, I don't know if you'd heard of tektites um i thought that i was fairly well versed in mysterious phenomena and ancient mysteries as i say that's been a passion for me for like 30 years i was really sort of surprised to you know, learn about an entire new mystery when i first encountered them um so i think one thing is that i don't know how well known they are in the fields in the various fields that interact with them so maybe it's not a popular field although there to be honest there's been 
uh, hundreds of papers written on the topic. So there's definitely some people involved. Um, but I suppose it hasn't had the level of awareness that it should have for a mystery of that size, definitely. Because, like, why are we not seeing a National Geographic special on this stuff? You know, like an event of that scale, debris raining down across 12,000 kilometers. You know, it, it, it just to me, it strikes me as amazing that I had to find that out through some a side angle of obscure research I was doing of something else that I ended up stumbling on this thing about tektites and, and then about these australites that I'm amazed that this isn't a bigger story. So I think perhaps there isn't enough people on the problem for a start. So not enough independent fingers, uh, not enough new blood going into that mystery. I think that's an issue because if you have people that have spent, say, 20 years believing a certain narrative, those aren't the best people to come up with a new idea when the science changes. Because uh, you have a couple of things, human interest, you know, like invested in your credentials, your name, what you've achieved. For some people, that can be a threat, you know, and I'm not, I don't say it all. Some scientists love change. They love, you know, when things update. Some people, you know, they see that they've invested a lot in a certain story. Uh, you also have, I think you have some of the phenomena that is similar to what happened with um, meteorites, that if you go back a couple hundred years, you know, meteorites only became accepted because there was a, a shower that would, involved so many witnesses and so many um, stones coming down that they accepted that meteorites were real. That you know, before a couple hundred years ago, meteorites were seen as woo-woo, um, fantasy. You know, of course, rocks aren't falling from the sky, you know, you stupid imbeciles. Um, so you've got to think about that. And then, of course, that didn't mean there was no meteorites before 200 years ago right so you'd had asteroids comets everything going past and the astronomers and scientists of the day had just dismissed it right so if that was seen as too wild to go there i mean this is really quite wild when you start dealing with aliens there's a lot of scientists who are going to be stuck in that paradigm which is and i'm sure you've seen the, the phrase it's never aliens right and there's a lot of scientists and i've seen with them in their bio that it's never aliens so if you have that mindset and that's the paradigm that you've done most of your work and your career in. I don't think that style has a good position for flexibility to change. So we're going to have a very small number of initial thinkers, people like Abby Loeb, for example. Um, others, I would suggest, like you know, Paul Davies, who's a a, a guy, you know, he's a, yeah. both a mathematician, physicist, and that he thinks a lot on this kind of question. What we what could we look for in terms of aliens? Um, there's a couple of others that you know I think are quite forward thinking, but not many. You know, if you, if you look, you often find the same the same names again and again on articles that are forward thinking on kind of techno signatures and the search for aliens. Maybe a dozen scientists, you know, that are in those fields who are putting out ideas about you know how we can find them and expecting that we should find their technologies. Um, so I don't think you've got a lot of people. So again, so once you restrict down a number of people that are open to something and the number of people that know about that phenomena so now we're thinking you know, how many of those people even know about the tektite issue right so we start to get to a very small number of thinkers and then plus the paradigm issue that we're only just now entering a time when we're accepting interstellar objects exist also accepting that probably aliens will send probes that we should look for kind of uh, signatures of technology, you know, techno signatures signatures of alien technology rather than expecting you know i don't know an alien coming up to the White House, you know, introducing themselves. So that's that's super unlikely. They were much more likely to text something like a mega structure, you know, which would be, you know, it could be an energy harvesting machine surrounding a sun or something like I described you earlier, like you know, a sphere. floating mega brain or one of these things. These are much more likely to be detected than to have an alien just turn up here and say, welcome to the Galactic Federation. I think that's really, mm -hmm. you know, almost no chance of that. That's just my take. Uh, I think that, you know, again, the other things we're looking for, of course, radio signals, and as Paul Davies, again, you know, he's suggested we might be looking looking genetics, that we might want to look for a signature of modification of DNA in prehistory, which is, he says, one of his favorites. And that's definitely one of my favorites. But there's only a few people that are going to go there. So I think, John, we've got a combination of being right on the cusp of a paradigm change combined with not enough thinkers in that field. Uh, and that I think that's going to slowly that those are going to be combined as we have more and more scientists at NASA saying, let's look for these techno signatures. You know, we're getting funding now. Um, they're going back into SETI. They've been out of it for a long time. Right. Um, so we're going to get some of the best minds start looking again through the data and seeing what is there. And I suspect that some of them are going to look and see in their own papers um, from the 60s that there was, you know, great thinkers 
of that time saying this stuff seems to come from an object breaking up in space that's made of weird glass you know we don't know really know what this is and i would hope that that would get some of these scientists rethinking the limited hypotheses that were put forward that i think were just centered on that time when nobody believed that these kind of objects are out there and nobody was talking about mega structures in the 60s I don't know, as far as i know you know mm -hmm. this is fairly recent stuff the idea that there's dyson spheres and um you know yeah say floating alien brains i mean most of this stuff is really kind of cutting edge so i think it's a combination of factors but don't be surprised if you know within a few years uh, you're seeing you know hypotheses like this being offered by conventional voices and myself you know people with the phds and stuff I did a show for History Channel a few years back, and we talked about alien megastructures. And in CGI, I got to create a Dyson sphere harnessing the power of the sun and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's mm -hmm. it's a fa it's just a fascinating angle. I mean, you and I could probably do a whole show just on the um, mm -hmm. hypothetical part, you know, merging with the sure. machines and AI and mm -hmm. and thinking uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. One of my favorite favorite ap aspects of this whole conversation that you know is just fun to to think about but mm -hmm. that said with your way of thinking because i know you you were talking about thinkers and when you get into this level you're talking about a very small number that would that would entertain uh these types of possibilities but the way that that bruce fenton thinks right now mm -hmm. and the years of research that you've done into this and the debris field that you've analyzed and the and the piece that you're looking at and all the science and calculations and everything are you convinced that this is connected to a alien intelligence or alien technology or do you feel that you've just seen enough to say mm. that's a possibility uh, on a personal level i would say first of all, i'm 99 percent convinced that we're dealing with an interstellar object and that I'm probably 90% convinced it's an alien technology. So, I mean, I got that little niggling doubt, and I think that part of that is because it's just so extraordinary and, pro and profound that if it's true, um, that the impact of that, there's a bit of me that thinks, you know, can that really be true? You know, am I crazy to even think that can be true? So it's not necessarily that the, I don't think that the evidence is that problematic. I just think it's such a wild thing to go from the theoretical, you know, that probably aliens are out there, maybe aliens are doing this maybe aliens are doing that to oh actually perhaps we've got debris from an alien megastructure and i've got pieces of it in my bedroom right it just feels so extraordinary that i think that the doubt level goes up that you know there must be something i'm not seeing there um that makes it just a normal you know a natural interstellar object um i am yeah as i say i am 99 percent convinced this is an interstellar object though and that in itself would change the paradigm because yeah. you know the currently it's not accepted that any material from an interstellar object exists on Earth. So if we confirm that that's what this is, then it makes it, first of all, it makes it the first known incident of an interstellar object accepted, if it's accepted. So 788,000 years, obviously, is a lot earlier than 2014. Uh, and then secondly, it'd be the first where we have the debris in our hands. And so we can actually go back and then revisit that material and say, well, what's interesting about it other than it just being you know anomalous is there anything in here that points to the kind of solar system it may have come from if this is directly material from an object from another solar system not melt glass it's the literal pieces of it now we revisit that and say well these isotopic anomalies so these are not created by um, isotopic fractionization during an impact that these are the genuine differences between um earth makeup and some other solar system. Those are going to be really interesting things to look at. So don't get me wrong, but I think that's going to be amazing for the science, you know, cosmology and astronomy. Um, but yeah, I just, that 90%, I mean, 90% is still high, let's be honest. I mean, that's <laughs> for it being an alien megastructure. Yeah, I'm mostly there. I have those moments every now and again. I think, if I, is there something I missed? Is there, you know, am I wrong somewhere? But, you know, without, without the feedback, critical feedback of a wider community of experts, it's really hard to to get to more certainty or more doubt. Uh, I've had a couple of different scientists, you know, a geologist and you know a former planetary geologist, who have both kind of looked at my paper and they they find it compelling, you know, and convincing. Um, they give me some feedback on where you know things where I've put arguments poorly or whatever. You know, it's my first ever scientific paper, so you know, of course, there's going to be 
areas in construction ne mm -hmm. not necessarily in thinking but certainly in construction um so, but they've been so that's been really heartening that you know people that are familiar with writing papers and on these kind of topics uh, have said that well yeah it does support what you're saying the paper you've produced supports what you're saying now i just add here i wrote the paper because you know people would say to me on social media say well you know if you're so sure of yourself you think it's real why haven't you got a paper you know and you've probably seen people say things like that in arguments mm -hmm. you know that it's only kind of real if you've got a peer-reviewed paper and otherwise mm -hmm. you know you're full of it and so it, it wasn't something i really wanted to do it was something i felt in the end that it, it was that important that if it was real that i had to support it in a way that scientists could pick up that ball and carry it forward because there's only a limit to what i can do with with zero funding no lab no team you know no great media platform you know if it's real all i can do is raise the ball high enough that someone else sees it and picks it up right who's got so is that, to do that is that paper available to the public it is yeah that's on researchgate and on academia.com so okay. those are you know networks for scientists you can upload your papers and so stuff you're stuff. welcoming feedback from Mm -hmm. whomever is watching you right now, you want them to look at that, elevate it to the next level. And and one of my last questions to you is, and by the way, anybody who's listening or watching, uh, I will link all of this in the show notes. That way you can see Bruce's paper. And if you either are a someone who can peer review it or know somebody who can or get it to the right hands, by all means, take a look at it. Uh, so I'll make sure that that link is there. But we've mentioned uh, Avi Loeb, Dr. Avi Loeb, Harvard, part of the, uh, you know, founder of the Galileo Project. And he's going out and getting that object in the Papua New, New Guinea field underwater. And, and I've heard a little bit about that very brief, mm -hmm. but uh, we touched on that before. Is he either looking at the same debris field, looked at your paper? Is there any kind of connection there i mean this sounds like this is what he's doing in just a different field i mean meaning debris field is this something that he can look at or has looked at uh it's something i would I'd very much like him to look at i did shoot a couple of emails to the galileo project and i used their their box on their website i think two or three times i've never had a reply and that's just an initial you know I want to communicate about some work that i'm doing so I, i've been disappointed because you would think that that'd be a quite well monitored um, entry point to the Galileo project. Mm -hmm. So I didn't hear anything from that. And I didn't hear anything from a direct email to, to have either. Uh, again, I understand this, the busy people. So I sort of wrote it off as that, but I mean, I have sent it to other people that know him. So, and in fact, people on the team and I've not heard anything back. So I don't know what to make of that in a way. Cause I think that they would, even if they were just to say, we don't buy it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be quite happy with just that kind of response. If someone just came back and said, you know what, Bruce, uh, think this part of it just doesn't make sense or, you know, good luck with it, that kind of thing. So I, I don't really understand. I don't know if it's that nobody has read those emails or those contacts or or what that's about. Because like, cause not the, the strange thing is that there's not many people doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's not like there's floods of people are going to say, you know, I've got a paper on, you know, techno signatures or uh, interstellar objects. There's a few, but there's not loads because, again, these are fairly new topics. So I'm not quite sure. I would have thought that he'd know something of it. What I do understand, though, is that in an interview that I think is out tomorrow, um, someone has asked him about the paper. But I don't know. Of course, I don't know yet what his response was, whether it was that he'd never heard of it or whether, you know, he's looking at it. So that's going to be really interesting, to be honest, John, as to you know, what actually is said in that. Because at the very least, from tomorrow, he, or I assume now, he is aware of it. So that interview has happened. Um, so whether he was aware before or not, he now is. So I think, it, what do you think? Not unreasonable to expect him to comment somewhere about it, isn't it? I think. Yeah, I, and that's a little disappointing to hear just simply because it sounds like he's traversing into the same vein of work that you've done for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So even if he did feel you were wrong, um, and I'm not saying you are, but you know, if you sure. felt like you you were misguided or wrong about a scientific whatever that he that he would uh, respond. So that's a little disappointing to hear. But who who knows what will happen with that interview? Please, you know, definitely mm -hmm. keep me updated. And if that uh, drops by the time this airs on my channel, I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well. Um, sure. Bruce, I can't thank you enough for all of the time that you've given me. Uh, here in closing, if the audience wants to reach out to you, how can they do that? How can they get in contact with you? 
Sure. I mean, if anyone's got sort of, you know, pertinent information, contacts or, you know, questions, um, they certainly can reach me by email. So um, bruce at brucefenton.info. You know, I'm open to uh, things on there. So, you know, what I can't probably help with is, you know, all kinds of stuff, theories about aliens and stuff on there, you know, because obviously if there's anything to do with uh, you know, this topic, I'd be quite happy to hear from anyone on that or if they feel that they know anyone that could, as you say, you know, uh, look at this and give opinions, you know, I'd appreciate that. Uh, I do have, you know, a presence on Twitter. So if someone can get me on social media, they can, you know, PM me on there as well. So that's um, Geological SETI is my sort of handle on there. Uh, I'm open to, you know, DM on these topics as well. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to get hold of me. And I say the Perfect. papers on ResearchGate that has a messaging system on there. So if someone reads it and wants to just instantly ask me something, then I, I do check on that ResearchGate page so they can contact me through there. Awesome. And I'll make sure that the email, the website, brucefenton.info is all in the show notes and links also to the two books that you mentioned. I'll get that uh, Amazon author page link over there for anybody interested in your other books. Uh, but honestly, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with it. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely be watching. And if there's any developments, please feel free to, to give me a call and, and drop me a line. I'd, I'd love to have you back. Appreciate it. That'd be that'd be awesome. And you know, the one thing I really hope for, John, to be honest, apart from what it, you know, whether it turns out to be absolutely real, so I would love to see that Nat Geo special where they show something mm -hmm. blowing up and debris flying for hundreds. It just seems a missed opportunity. You know, this absolutely amazing event, and most people don't know about it. So, at the very least, I hope I'm raising attention to an extraordinary period in history. So, yeah, thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate I it. And Hopefully Absolutely. And if I can throw out what's what's very cool about this conversation is even though, you know, you you, you were talking about the alien uh, potential connection there, mm -hmm. even if it was natural, how big of a discovery that would be. And that that's why mm -hmm. I love that story in this conversation is that mm -hmm. even if it turns out to not be alien, the natural explanation is pretty fascinating in and of itself. So very, very cool. I, I really appreciate the conversation, Bruce. Thank you again. And thank you all for listening and watching. It's always a big help. If you're watching on YouTube, click the thumbs up button, make sure you're subscribed to this channel. I have a lot of fun making these interviews, especially with people like Bruce, where I get to explore topics I know nothing about. So I'm learning right along with you, but that's what this channel is. Uh, you get to peek into my journey of trying to find the truth behind all of these mysteries mysteries and, and uh, obviously take that journey with me and make up your own mind. So thank you for doing that. Again, make sure you uh, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on the podcast version, please do the same. I aim for five stars with these shows. If you don't know that these interviews drop to audio form, it's listed under the Black Vault Radio on any podcast aggregator that you watch. With that said, this is John Greenwell Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.